Many people marvel at the allure of winemaking. This show was meant to give you a sneak peek behind the curtain with an exclusive view of what goes into the magic of making a bottle. Come with me as we explore local wineries, meet the vintners, and experience wines from all over the world. My name is Raquel Mullaney. Welcome to Uncorked. Hi everyone, welcome to Uncorked, and I am so excited to be here today with Dave Roberts of Furro Vineyards. How are you? Doing great. Couldn't be any better. Wonderful. Well, you're a very special person to us. Uh, when my husband Bob and I started the 1620 Winery, you single-handedly got us on our feet. So I can't thank you enough from the bottom of our heart to say thank you for doing that. And I have never been part of an industry that is so collaborative like the wine industry. So thank you. Well, you're really welcome. And it was... Uh I remember that day very well, <laughs> by the way. And I said, oh, these guys are going to join us in this business. And it was great. We, uh, This is one of the places where we don't feel like people are competitors. They help us build from within. It's so and unique. And it's really about, as you know, we have a great association. It's really about helping each other. We do. So I want to learn more about how Truro Vineyards came to be. So tell me a little bit about your history. Well, I got a long history. OK. <laughs> I got time. However. Um, <laughs> Real quickly, this is, you know, we have a house outside of Boston, but we really live here. Okay. And we have a house near, about a mile from here, a nice little bike ride. And I have been coming here even before my wife and I got married. And 52 years ago, we spent our honeymoon one mile from here. Oh, nice. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Besides the fact it was a beautiful place, my mom and dad had a place that we could get for free. <laughs> <laughs> that is key. That is very key. Yeah. So, so we started, you know, we have a long history here. We always loved it. It was started by two ladies, the vineyard itself. In 1991, they bought it. One of them was from the Finger Lakes area. They had the vision. They planted all 3,500 vines themselves. What made uh, them pick here? Do you know? What made them well, pick? you know what they said is they, they had been to Long Island mm -hmm. and saw that it was very much the same kind of viticultural area. Okay. Um, and this land was available, it's a southern slope, it's like perfect. So one of the ladies was from Long Island, how about the other lady? She was from Indiana. Okay. Indiana. Yeah, so they, so they bought it, and now you plant grapes, and they planted all 35, they were viticultural people, they really loved the soil. And what they did was they, they got everything planted, but then they had to live, they weren't that wealthy. So what did they plant first? So they, the planted, they planted three different uh, vinifera grapes, mm -hmm. um, Cabernet Franc, mm -hmm. Chardonnay, and Merlot. Wonderful. And uh, that's where they started. In the meantime, this became this old house, which is 20 years old, was a bed and breakfast. That's, wow. how, they, that's how they survived. So they ran a bed and breakfast until the wine started producing some delicious grapes. Three years to get the first grape. Wow. Another year to get your first white wine. Two years to get your next red yes. wine. So it takes a little capital to get through that. Yeah. The wine business is definitely not something that's turnkey. You need to spend a couple of years to produce wine to get up and running. It is. <clears throat> and it takes, it, you know, it's the old saying, it takes a village. In our case, it takes a family. So yeah. <laughs> you know, my daughter, my son, they have another daughter that's part owner. They're all owners of the business. So we were talking about the lovely women that founded this vineyard. They were using this beautiful 200-year-old house as a bed and breakfast to kind of make ends meet while they were physically making the wine. So what happened after that? So they had their first wines. Actually, they found a great winemaker who then stayed on with us um, before our present winemaker. He eventually retired after 10 years um, and uh, over 20 years here. But his name was Matthias. Matthias Vogel, he was a Hungarian, mm -hmm. and he really helped them through it because they knew some good wine information, but enough not to be dangerous. In a way, I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> I'll say it. Yeah, you, you know about it, so you need help. We all do. Yes. And so um, Matthias stayed with us. I still remember my conversation with him. I said, "You helped my son, who knew a lot about. He was a brewer, mm -hmm. but he hadn't made wine." Okay. And so I said, you help my son learn everything he can do. You have a job here for as long as you want to work. Wow. So. And that's the way it worked. How long did the ladies own it before they sold it to you? 
16 years. 16 years, and you bought it when? 2007. Okay, 2007. Were you scared? Um, no, I, I don't think scared would be right, but, but you know. I won't lie, was, I was scared. It was, <laughs> well, in our case, it was about our family. Yeah. I was concerned because I, I was so committed to be successful mm -hmm. because, and I've been in business and done other things for other people, but their own thing. I had my son moving from Atlanta with two children. Yeah. I had my daughter um, who was moving here at that point unmarried, but since has two children, she was changing her life. And our other daughter was an owner um, and works as a lawyer in, in Boston. But it changed all our lives to yeah. some, in, a, in a beautiful way. Right. So we were really lucky. Yeah. It's a big risk. It, it, but it can be, yeah. It's a big risk. It can be. So tell me a little bit about the different wines that you make here at Truro Vineyards. Well, we do we do um, a number of things. Kind of our, our one of our background wines that really is a backbone to kind of the numbers of the business is our lighthouse bottles. They're, um, Those are infamous. They're, they're infamous and nobody ever throws them away. They, <laughs> they last forever. People come in with cases of empty saying, That's you know, great. can you reuse them? We should do great. something. That's great. But um, so we have that series of wine, one of which is the, the cranberry red. It's a red grape wine infused with cranberries. Cape Cod cranberries. So it's not just strictly cranberries, it's a blend it's of grape and cranberries. It's actually a very substantial red wine infused with cranberries. I didn't know that. Yeah, so I it's really something. different. It's hard to make a pure cranberry wine. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah. And so, but then as, as you see over here, we have um, a wide selection of reds and whites. We actually have 16 different varietals. Okay. Yeah, that we uh, have changing. We've got an, our newest here is that. Uh, is M. So tell me about M. <coughs> well, M is named for our new winemaker who has been here new two years ago. The name is Milan, Milan Vujadic. Milan Vujadic. <coughs> Vujadic. And where's Milan he's, from? He's, he's Croatian. Not Milan. <laughs> yeah, not Milan. No. He's, he's Croatian. And when he came here, one of our challenges was we want you to make, you find the best grapes, make the best combination, or single vineyard or whatever you think is right okay. for something we could because it takes two years to get here yep with barrel aging yep and this is what he uh, introduced us to which is called M and it's a blend of what it's a blend of Petit Syrah mm -hmm. uh, Petit Verdot mm -hmm. and Malbec roughly even well, I can't wait to crack that sucker open. we're <laughs> not gonna let this interview get over without doing That's that right. now you talked about Milan and he has a little bit of a, a harrowing history to get here. He did. He, he, he escaped um, Croatia from, you know, with the war raging behind him. Um, came in, had, went through friends into Maryland, lived there for, I think, about five years. Helped a number of wineries, so he had his education was in winemaking. Mm -hmm. and, he, and he helped some friends there and actually some, uh, a vineyard in, in Virginia. Mm -hmm. Then ended up going to California. I spent the last 15 years in Napa Valley area, 12 or 15 years, Very and nice. been in Napa Valley. And uh, and when we had an opportunity, he saw our ad and he wanted to get closer to New York mm -hmm. because his wife is a New Yorker. Yeah. So oh, wow. there you go. Nice. So I understand that you have a tremendous amount of vines and you grow a lot of grapes yourself, but to create something this complex, you must have to get some grapes from somewhere else? Yeah, we do. Just we do both. So, we, so as I said, from? we grow Chardonnay, Cabernet Franc, and Merlot here. Mm -hmm. um, we have a great relationship with uh, three brothers and lands of brothers in uh, Susan Valley, which is great adjacent. You may know of that. We do. And, uh, <laughs> and they do a great source. They're really good people. They come out here. They, they really believe in it, and, and they stand by everything they should do. They are so wonderful. I don't know if I've told you the story before, but they cut down 40-year-old Cab Sob wine vines from the vineyard, shipped them from California to Plymouth, Mass, and we turned that into our grand ballroom chandelier at the really? 1620 yeah. Winery at Quarter yeah. Park. So I love when my brides walk in and they look up wow. and the first thing they see is How those 40-year-old nice. yeah. Cab Sob wine vines. Yeah, no, that's, that, I'm not surprised. So they're amazing family to work yeah. with because well, we also get yeah, a yeah. from so, them. So our, Relationship with them is we get what they call early pick because they got a, they get picked between six in the morning and ten mm -hmm. before it warms up. Mm -hmm. 
the grapes go right out the refrigerated trucks. By 10.30, they're shipping on the, they're heading our way. Three days later, mm -hmm. they're kept at 40 degrees, between 40 and 42, they arrive here as grapes. I have another really fun story. Bob and I were literally sitting with Ron Lanza in his winery while your shipment of grapes was going out to Troll oh, Mass funny. Cape Cod. And yeah. they were also stopping at First yeah. Crush on the way. So yeah. it was so neat to be halfway around the country it's and to see my friend yeah. Dave Roberts getting his grapes shipped yeah. across the country. So that was yeah. pretty cool. So we bring in grapes from primarily from that area. We have some from uh, Paso, Paso Robles. Uh, and some from Rhode Island, mm -hmm. and some we get from our friends at Westport. Wonderful, wonderful. So being in the business for as long as you have, you must have some great stories, but what I really want to know is, what has been your biggest surprise about being in the wine industry? Well, I've, I've sold literally millions of cases in my life, or had somebody else help me sell it, mm -hmm. but only the winery is really different, mm -hmm. as you know. And what happened, I mean, everything falls here. And when you have a big company, you have a lot of people helping you do things. Mm -hmm. Here, it's us. Right. So, I'll tell you my very nice biggest surprise. Okay. My children. Oh. And it shouldn't be a surprise, but they, they, the, they have really jumped in and done a great job. Really? And uh, Kristen really runs the, what they call it, the front of the house yeah. and the marketing. Um, David has taken over the whole production side. Milan works for David. Mm -hmm. um, and David also really focuses on the um, spirit production. So he's a mad scientist, as yeah. I call it. He, he's the one that creates all these wonderful drinks we have. Well, I really would love to pick your brain off camera because Bob and I also have four children and we would love to see them. This is our legacy that we would like to leave to them, the 1620 Winery. So how you did it and was able to have your children make a living off of your winery. Yeah, they, this um, is their life. Yeah. yeah I'm going to share with you one sure. thing that we haven't talked about, is we have an advisory board. Oh. Now, but it's, you, you've met a lot of people in your business, and I have too. And I was lucky enough to find eight people that really, trust me, it's not safe, you're not going to change their lifestyle. They're doing this because of friendship and love. Yes. But we only meet once a, once a year occasionally twice a year and they help us set the sale for our business for the next year Wow! and my kids always kid me say dad we love it because you listen to them and I always kid them because I said yeah and so do you <laughs> <laughs> but they're very professional a fellow that ran 18 plants around the world mm -hmm. a fellow that did the legal work for one of the biggest um, distillers in the world great accountant mm -hmm. a, a woman who runs uh, one of the big wineries out of Dow, out of uh, Paso Robles, mm -hmm. she's president. Uh, another fellow who's got the best palate for business. Wow. So we really got this combination of restaurateur locally who's, you know, really can kind of keep us in tune with what's happening, what's not. Would you say that's your secret sauce of well, helping you be successful uh, it, as you it, are? It, it, it was really, and, and they say this, and you know, and non-solicited that the group is become. They've all some of them didn't know each other. Right. I know them all, but they didn't right. necessarily know each other. Yeah. And they become, they really enjoy, I mean, we have a wonderful, you know, four or five days when they come in and it's really focused. We work hard, have a little fun. That's fantastic. But we really get a chance to throw away some ideas and pick up some new ideas. So with that secret sauce, I hear that you have expanded into spirits. We have. Tell me have. a little bit about your spirits. Well, it's, it's funny because everybody, the rumor around Truro was when we bought it, they knew my son came out, he was a brewer, mm -hmm. master brewer. So that was his background. What they didn't think through is, and you may not know this, but to make beer, you start, it's the same process you do, but then take it a step further to make spirits. Right. And David really wanted to do that. And he, we like, really? <laughs> but he did. And, he was, and for a lot of reasons, you know, this is a very ecologically um, challenged place. You have to be really yeah. careful with the water. We sit right over the water supply for the town of Truro right. and for Provincetown. Wow. And so we're very, very careful with everything we do. We don't discharge water. We don't do anything. So we have to really watch how that works. Mm -hmm. And it's much, much more easy to work with a spirit because of the concentration that you do than with a beer, which is 
a lot of liquid. Right. Yeah. Right. So that was good. Well, I would love to. Um, Oh, take, well, we're going to visit them, I hope. Little, yeah, yeah, take a little trip and go uh, take a look. So yeah. we'll be right back right. after this. So we are now in the operations nerve center of Truro Vineyards, and we're with the head winemaker, Milan, and he's going to give us a little bit of a tour. So tell me a little bit, Milan, about what's going on in the stainless steel tanks behind us. So what's currently going on at the stainless steel tanks, we have uh, one tank in the middle over there that's uh, still fermenting. The one on the, the big one on the, on the end and the one next to it, you can see this frost um, around it. Uh, we have two that's Rosé and Sauvignon Blanc respectively. They're cold stabilizing right now. Okay. So we have the cooling on and uh, that's, they're sitting at about 28 degrees right now and they'll be sitting there for another week. Um, and then um, we will check the cold stability and make sure it's cold stable, at which point we'll rack it out and um, the wine will be ready pretty much for bottling. So how long has it been sitting in that stainless steel tank? Uh, for about a week. Okay. Uh, under the, as the, as the cold stable. Okay, and then before the cold stabilization, how long does it sit it, before? It's fermented there uh, for about two and a half weeks. Okay. Uh, after that, we just let it settle because the, after the fermentation, wine is still loaded with carbon dioxide. So we have to let it calm down a little bit. And after that, uh, another maybe week and a half to two weeks, at which point we uh, rack it off. Mm -hmm. Uh, of the, the lees. Yep. Uh, clean, uh, clean wine goes back in the same tank uh, and then we add uh, bentonite for heat stabilization and um, which is a natural clay. And, and I uh, always tell our viewers he's saying lees not leaves. <laughs> lees. L-E-E-S. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and, um, and then it's gonna sit there for about for another week so it'll be, it'll be two weeks. Uh, we found that normally within two weeks uh, time, uh, most wines get uh, stable. Okay. Uh, which we will check after the fact, and if it needs a little bit more time, we'll live a little bit on, a little bit further on. If not, we'll just rack it off, and uh, wine will be ready for bottling, which we'll probably do maybe in early January. So from the beginning to the end, from receiving your grapes and crushing them and stemming them, to putting it in a bottle and putting it in the shop for sale. How much time goes by? For the whites? For the whites. Um, I would say about three to four months. Okay. Wow, great. And yeah. it's delicious wine. Thank you. Very, very delicious. Um, anything else in this um, operation area specifically that you'd like to share with our viewers? Everything else is, uh, is either settling. So we have in these tanks here mm -hmm. and in this particular, this is, you can see how it's not filled all the way. Yeah. Uh, normally you want all the containers to be full, right. but uh, in this particular case it's not a big deal because uh, we have uh, red wine, this this here is a uh, state Cabernet Franc. Because I know oxygen is not your friend when it comes to making wine. No, but at this stage uh, oxygen cannot really do any really damage because there's still, wine is still protected by carbon dioxide, okay. there's still plenty of carbon dioxide in it. So we have pressed this last week, uh, this is the state Cabernet Franc, uh, we let it settle in these tanks and then uh, tomorrow actually I'm planning on putting it in barrels. Okay so when you say a state cab franc what does that mean for our that viewers? That means that the grapes have been grown on the property. So those are Truro vineyard, vineyard Truro grapes vineyards, not grapes. mixed with anything else. Nothing else in it. That's exciting I can't wait to taste that. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So Milan, tell me a little bit about what we're looking at in here. So here we have one of the five uh, bins where we ferment Cabernet Franc. Uh, is this and, a state uh, cab? Uh, this is not the state Not a state cab, no, okay. This is not the state cab. This is, uh, so this means cab it came from, from California, yes. okay. So uh, as you can see, um, the cap uh, or these solids have sunk uh, quite a bit. It means that the fermentation is well pretty done. much right. nearing its end um, or it's almost finished. Uh, so uh, what happens here is after the fermentation is done, we will uh, let it macerate like this for about a week um, or, or, or a week and a half at least uh, to get a little bit more extraction uh, of the uh, tannins from uh, mainly from seeds and skins to, um, uh, to build up the structure of the wine. 
And uh, after that, we will take uh, this Vince and his four brothers uh, outside uh, and uh, have them pressed and start squishing. Start squishing. Bringing in the ladies and stamping and stomping like Lucille Ball. I uh, know we do that before. Oh, oh, oh the ladies come in before. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, this is kind of a. Yeah. You a little mash. Yeah. Will you think less of me if I say I really want to stick my head in here with a straw? Oh, please go ahead. <laughs> please go ahead. <laughs> it looks so delicious. The color is amazing. And uh, so, yeah, so after we uh, press this off, uh, it's going to basically happen the same thing that uh, that we did to the uh, our state cabinet front. We'll uh, pump it into a tank, you let it mash. settle for a little bit and uh, you know, for a week or so and then we will uh, move it into barrels. Yeah. To yeah. Does this ever get old and for you? And you can buy it. Uh, we buy it. Not really. Yeah. No, not really. What part of winemaking do you love the most? You know what I love about winemaking the most? It's every year is different. Yes. And every day is kind of different. Because you, you never of, know what grapes you never, you're going to get. No, you, ne you never know what's, go what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And the weather. And, uh, with the weather, with the grapes, with the fermentation. So especially if you have fermentations in uh, dif different uh, vessels. Yeah. So we have five bins of Cabernet Franc here. So there's uh, two. There are two. There are two out there and just move them around a little bit yeah. uh, to move other things around this morning. But um, so they're basically, it's a one wine, but it's five different fermentations. You're right. And they're all a little different. They are. They are. So um, you must enjoy being part of a family owned boutique -y type of vineyard that, you know, we're not Yellowtail here. We're Truro Vineyards and we're really customizing our wines to what absolutely. our our patrons want. Absolutely. Uh, it's it's much more relaxed environment. Yeah. Um, you know, I do kind of feel like I'm member of the family. You are part of the family. Yeah. I know Dave and, very uh, well and he feels that you are a member yeah. of the family. <laughs> and uh, it's it's really nice. I mean, I do I do treat this like as if it was my own. Wonderful. Um, and um, you know, always trying to do the best. It and is your own. Your name is on the bottle, M. That's for this right, lovely yeah. wine that is in my glass. That's so, right. let's go take a look at your barrel room. Okay. So Milan, we're in the barrel room at Truro Vineyards. They are beautiful and sky high. So tell me a little bit about the wine that is in here and about the barrels that they're sitting in. So we have a combination of things currently in barrels. So these here, you see these breeder, breeder yeah. bumps? So uh, this is a Chardonnay. This 2018 Chardonnay that's just finished its primary fermentation. So we ferment part of our Chardonnay in barrels and part in stainless steel tanks and then we combine them actually that's that's why some things are scattered around because we were doing it this morning um, uh, doing the trials basically on a weekly basis we pull samples of these um, uh, from each barrel um, of chardonnay and then appropriately uh, proportionally we uh, blend with the stainless steel part and then we evaluate them and see whether it's time to pull them out of the oak. Yeah, so when you say you're doing trials, I'm going to assume that that's where all that heavy-duty chemistry comes involved. Well, trials, not the chemistry, there's not much involved. It's more of a sensory uh, in this particular case. But yeah, there is some, some chemistry involved uh, in testing and you know, some other trials and, okay. and stuff. So basically, we're just uh, evaluating the, the sensory properties of uh, the wines that are from the barrels and the wines that are from the tanks and putting them together and see how they taste together, whether it's too much oak, not enough oak, because we're trying so, not to get our Chardonnay too oaky. So I noticed that this is a Hungarian oak barrel. Do you yes. use only Hungarian or do you use American French? We use American French and Hungarian. Okay, I'll So see. this particular one is, uh, is Hungarian. Um, these are also Hungarian. Yeah. Uh, you can tell, for example, this is the name of the Cooperage, Kalina, yeah. uh, 1959 is probably when they were founded. Uh, this is a type of oak from Hungary, medium toasted heads, meaning the medium toast. Yeah. With these, these are the heads. Yep. Uh, they're also toasted. Uh, 20, 24 month air dried, meaning that the staves used uh, or the oak used for this was uh, dry aged uh, or air aged for. Um, uh, 24 months and this is the year of the production of the barrel 2017. So when you say toasted that physically means that the barrel on the inside is burnt? Yes. Yes. Now what does this little happy number mean? Uh, this little happy number means uh, <laughs> this is our own little doing so 
This is a 2017 year of the when we first used this, when we first filled this barrel. And 14 is the this is the barrel 14 of that particular vintage. And how many times will you use a barrel before you retire it? Uh, well, we use it uh, for first four years. Mm -hmm. Uh, barrel uh, keeps giving off oak uh, um, flavor and, and aromas into uh, uh, into wine. After the year four, uh, barrel is considered neutral. Right. So we use them for 10, 15 years, mm -hmm. but we use the combination. Mm -hmm. So for example, in some of our reds, we would use, let's say if we have 10 barrel, 10 barrels. Mm -hmm. We will have two brand new barrels. We would have maybe two or three two-year-olds, a couple of three-year-olds, and the rest would be Four year old and older. Wow. So that way you get, uh, when, once that wine is blended together, mm -hmm. um, you get a combination of uh, new oak, old barrels. Perfect. That's so, so that way, you know, if, if it was all new oak, the wine would be pretty much too oaky. Uh, yeah, it would be very heavy. Heavy. Exactly. Uh, my last question for you is how involved do you get in the bottling process? Very. <laughs> uh, you don't look very. excited about that. Well, I am yet, I've, I've been making wine um, pretty much as ever I can remember, but commercially for about 15 years. Okay. Um, I am yet to meet a winemaker that's excited about bottling. <laughs> I walked off the bottling line after my third barrel. I was like, yeah, I'm done. It is, uh, the, the problem with bottling lines is that there's so many moving parts right. and everything needs to be fit into like a, you know, 16th of an inch. And if it isn't, the whole thing can be thrown up. So there's a lot of, it, bottling lines generally require a lot of patience. So when I looked at your bottling line, I was so impressed because I can see that you have a hopper for your corks. Yes. And my bottling line at the 1620 Winery, I literally have to put one cork in at a time and go ch chunk. So yeah, it is requires even more patience. It is incredibly manual. Every yeah. label goes on one label at a time. So I was so envious when I got to see yeah, your this, bottling this line. Yeah, this bottling line does about uh, 18 to 19 bottles, uh, sometimes even more. Maybe we, we can speed it up to 22 bottles a minute wow. if everything is running perfectly smooth. Wow! Uh, some wines, you know, tend to go uh, uh, slower than others, but uh, I would say about 19 to 20 uh, bottles a minute. I don't is, even uh, is think I get one bottle a minute, so I'm yeah. so impressed with you. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, it's it's you know, we, on on a really good day, we normally bottle about 350 cases, 400 cases. Well, Milan, uh, on behalf of Dave, the owner of Toro Vineyards, and myself, the 1620 Winery, thank you so much for taking time to share with my viewers here all of the wonderful things that happen at Toro Vineyards. You're very welcome. Cheers. It's a pleasure. Cheers. So we have meandered down the property to South Hollow Spirits, where I'm with Dave Jr. Yep. And he is in charge of all of the operations, as well as this fine looking piece of machinery behind us. So Dave, tell me a little bit about what we have going on in front of us here. All right, well, our line now includes um, five different rums. We have our three base rums, and we have a white rum, an amber rum, which is aged in oak barrels, mostly once used Chardonnay barrels. We also make a spiced rum. This was our flagship first product that we released. And then we have two reserve rums, which are aged rums, similar to the amber, but they're finished in port casks. And then we also have three gins in our line. Uh, we have a, a, just a regular um, kind of contemporary American dry gin. We have a barrel gin, and then we also have a brand new product that's a rosé flavored gin. Um, so did you always distill or tell me a little bit about your background and how you learned how to do this? No, I mean, I started out like most people I know in the industry, um, started out home brewing, um, like almost everybody I know in distilling industry, winemaking industry, beer, beer industry. Um, everybody starts out making five gallons of beer in their kitchen. Um, and then I got on with a couple different commercial brewers, brewed beer for a living for a while. And then my family moved out here to take over the winery and uh, make wine at Truro Vineyards, and then we opened up um, South Hollow Spirits as an offshoot uh, part of the business. So was it scary at all, making that jump from Atlanta to Massachusetts? Yeah, yeah, it was a little different. Uh, but, you know, I was very familiar with the area up here. I've been up here every year of my life. Uh, my grandmother lived up here right down the road from where we're standing right now. Mm -hmm. um, since I was a little kid, I've been coming up here. So um, always wanted to live up here, just never had a, 
a way to do it or an excuse and <laughs> finally had one, so gin took and, a chance. Gin and rum will do that too. Give right? you a really good excuse. Absolutely. So out of these products, are, are these, these are obviously different than the six up front, yes? Yeah, I mean, the, they're, it's mostly, these two are variations. This is an aged rum. It's a blend of molasses and cane rum, aged in a variety of different barrels, um, and then bottled at 84 proof. Wow. These, these are similar, uh, but they're finished in port casks. What's that mean? Um, well, they're, fit, they're aged the same way as the amber, mm -hmm. but then before I make a batch of amber, after the, the rum is blended, mm -hmm. before we add the water to it to bring it down to proof, we'll pull 60 gallons back and put it in a port barrel. Um, one is a white port barrel finish. We make, I have these two bottles over here. Um, we make two ports at Churro Vineyards. We make an estate white port um, that is from Chardonnay grapes that grow right there on the hill. Oh, nice. And then we also make a red port, more traditional, um, made from Petite Syrah grapes that we source. So both reserve. Right, these are both, you know, <laughs> yes. dessert wines. Wonderful. Um, kind of, you know, small batch stuff. But what we do is we finish the rum. So after it's already aged, it's been blended. Yeah. Again, it's a, a, it's a blend of molasses and cane rum, aged and blended and then we let it finish in the port casks and it picks up some of the sweet notes because port's a very sweet wine even right. though it's a high alcohol it has a lot of residual sugar to it um, it picks up some of those sweeter notes um, and really these are completely different animals from each other very different from the amber that they started out at because they do pick up some of those notes um, the white port in particular very much still tastes like a rum a lot of molasses character um, the red port finish one almost finishes more like a like a brandy or cognac so, um, Dave, I'm noticing different. that they're very similar in color. So you're saying one's white and one's red, and they're very finished? Uh, they're not. If you put them in the glass or if you hold them up, you can okay. tell that the, the red port finish is considerably darker. Oh, okay. Um, it's it's kind of hard to tell when they're filled at different levels. Maybe but, I just need a fuller bottle. But is that what you, you're telling me? Yeah, <laughs> or a glass. You yeah, want there a glass? you go. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. So out of all of these lovely products that we have in front of us, I see there's some metals sitting to the left. Yep. Tell me a little bit about those medals and what did you win? Um, these ones were kind of recent from the uh, the Denver um, International Spirits Competition. 20 boat amber, won a gold. So that would be this one. Amber, yeah. Okay. I'm sorry those aren't on there, but That's I always okay. lift them up and pass them yep. around during the tour. Spice Rum, double gold. That would be double gold right here. Spice Rum also won a double gold at the New York World Wine and Spirits, which is also a big, uh, big one. Wonderful. Um, this is New York, but it doesn't say which one is which. Um, this one is dry line gin, silver metal. That's our regular Excellent, dry line. wonderful. And 20 boat white rum. Is that this? Also a silver metal, yep. Wonderful, and I'll be your Vanna the, White. The two new gins uh, were both released this summer, so they haven't been entered. They haven't had time anything, yet. So but give them time and they that, will have a ribbon around their neck as well. That's why they're naked, these are also new, so. Wonderful. Yeah. Dave, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot about yeah, your you're spirits. you're very welcome, you're very welcome. I hope I can come again. I hope so, We'd love to have you. So Dave, Milan, I want to thank you so much for inviting us to your vineyard today and I'd love to celebrate with Milan's new creation, M. So would you be so kind as to open that up for us? Only Milan can open us. Yes. Not really. But. I hear that it's an amazing creation and um, we were so fortunate to see behind the scenes and how all this magic happened. This is the highlight of my job. This is the best part. Thank you. My guest is first. Thank you very much. In case you're wondering who this handsome man is, my husband Robert, who owns the 1620 Winery, and my driver. <laughs> so you probably shouldn't drink on screen. You're my driver. <laughs> here's to Truro Vineyards. Well, here's thank the 1620 you. as well. Cheers. It's so good to be with you guys. Milan, thank Milan, you so much. Thank you. Thank you to my guests and to you for joining us today. I'd love to know what your favorite wine is, so email me at raquel at 1620winery.com. You never know, we may feature your favorite on our next episode. Until then, cheers. <laughs>